Hello, I'm Shelley Kramer, one of the founding partners of Futurum Research, and I am excited today to be hosting a webinar on the cloudification of the contact center. And I am joined by three brilliant minds in this space. Jeff Nicholson, the global head of CRM at Pegasystems, John Gilman, the CEO of Clear Software, and Brandon Knight, the VP of Business Development for Contact Center Tolaris. So what we're going to talk about today is the fact that COVID-19 has permanently changed many aspects of the business world. Of course, we know that, we're living that, and perhaps none more than the operation of contact centers. With roughly 90% of contact centers currently using on-prem technologies, that's required organizations to kind of rethink how they're continuing to provide high levels of service while while allowing their employees to safely work from home. And from a consumer standpoint, if you're out there and over the course of the last six or seven months have needed customer service in some way, I'm sure you've kind of navigated this as well. So in this webcast, we're going to discuss why it's critical that organizations migrate their, these functions to the cloud, how to do that, and then we're gonna talk about some of the obstacles they may face along the way. Before we get started, I'd like my, my guests to introduce themselves. John, take it away. Sure. Um, John Gilman, CEO and founder of Clear Software. Brandon? Uh, Brandon Knight. I run the contact center practice at Solaris. And uh, prior to that, spent uh, almost the last 30 years running enterprise level contact centers uh, globally. So really from the operational side. Awesome. And Jeff, last but not least, last but never least, <laughs> you bet. Uh, it's great to be with everyone here. And so I'm the global head of CRM at Pega Systems, about a decade and a half in the CRM space and working closely with our great clients and partners and industry analysts like Gartner and Forrester and, and great folks like yourself. Looking forward to today's uh, conversation. Yeah, I think this is going to be really interesting. So Brandon, we're going to start off with you. Tell us a little bit. I know that Tolaris has a unique perspective in that you work with all different kinds of contact center providers. So in what ways are cloud-based contact centers different than what we see on-prem? That's a, that's a very good question, and, and you're right. We work with all the, the major suppliers out there. I think when you're looking at the differences between cloud and, and premises space, there's three major differences. Uh, the first is in, is in the cost. Uh, premises space equipment is, is a CapEx expense. You buy all the boxes up front versus cloud, which is an OpEx expense, um, little to no upfront cost. Um, and you, you're paying a subscription over time. The second one is really in how you access the features uh, and functionality, you know, the, the call routing. In, in the premises space, everything is modular, everything's in a box. You, you buy additional uh, service for what you want versus cloud, everything's all inclusive and, and it's, it's hosted by the provider. And I think the third uh, biggest difference is in access. The, with, uh, with the box, you have to be an admin, and if I get to route calls and I also get to do everything in the system, versus with the cloud system, you can do role-based access and, and log on-based access and limit what, what a person who uses the system can actually do. I think those are the three primary uh, differences between them. So it has some function, the cloud ha offerings have some functionality you don't necessarily get on-prem, which is kind of yeah. one of the key value propositions. That yeah. makes perfect sense. So Jeff, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I apologize. I was, saying, I was saying to your point, it has some features and, and benefits that you don't get in a premises space, but also with the cloud, you only pay for what you use, which is, right. which is a huge benefit as well. Well, and I think that's a huge benefit and a benefit that businesses are really looking for right now. You, the ability to scale up or scale down as you need it, as your business needs changed, as opposed to being kind of, you know, hamstrung by what you happen to have on-prem. So I think to me, that's a huge value proposition as well. And, and one that really should be part of the conversation when you're looking at, at cloudifying these contact center operations. So Jeff, Pega. Yes. Pega has a big focus on the customer relationship. We've worked with you guys a lot. I know that and you've recently begun pushing your CRM to the cloud. So what are some of the successes? Tell us a little bit about some of the successes that, that you've seen, and then I'll come back and ask you a little bit about some of the challenges that your customers have seen. So, so tell us a little bit about successes. Absolutely, and we've been focusing over the a number of years in making sure that we have really cloud-native architecture to allow our clients to be able to do the types of things that 
thankfully, they had, many, if not most, had in place when COVID hit. And one of the advantages that that allows them to do is to take advantage of that cloud native architecture and apply things like containerization. And to your to your great comment recently, Shelley, uh, that you just mentioned, helping them scale with demand. Right. So what we saw is our clients' demand went through the roof. Uh, we've all needed customer service, no doubt, and we're seeing a, a really a, a great need uh, for these engagements. But unfortunately, uh, you, while you can't scale humans, right, you, you can at least make sure that they have access to their to their environments, that they're able to field those those uh, inquiries, and move with the demand that comes. And the, the cloud native architectures allow you to scale up, scale down. And I think Brandon made a, a great point in that uh, you, you're not having storage that's not being used and you're able to quickly move up and, and quickly down. Yeah, and I think a, a quick example of that is, you know, when we're talking about COVID times, you know, in the early days of the pandemic, and Jeff, you and I've talked about this in prior interviews, mm -hmm. I know, but in the in, in the early days of the pandemic, we saw banks and financial institutions just get hit with this onslaught of of traffic to contact centers and and it was a challenge to be able to take care of all that traffic, to be able to take care of customers who were obviously stressed and trying to get information and everything else. So I know that some of the success stories that Pega has had has specifically been in this space with banking, financial services, and you know healthcare insurance and things like that. So I think that those are, you know, when you think when you're listening to this, webcast and you're thinking about use cases, that's kind of the thing, scale up, scale down. It's like something catastrophic happens. You know, another example would be, you know, severe weather. If you have a business that serves customers at a time and you're going through severe weather and things like that. So there are all different kinds of use cases, I think, for that, the, the cloud solution that really can deliver in big ways. So John, Clear has been focused on cloud enabling on-prem ERP systems like SAP and Oracle eBusiness Suite. Talk to us a little bit about how that fits into the context of cloud enabling the contact center. Absolutely, and I think for for those who don't know what we do, because we're we're not nearly as big as Tolaris or, or Pega, but uh, you know we're we're an automation platform that makes people faster at what they do. And we do that through two primary products. We have ClearWork, which is our business process management suite um, that really allows you to take your, your daily workflows and streamline them into one web browser. Um, so that if I have to go to five different systems and 25 screens to um, handle a customer call or you know, type in a customer order, we streamline that all into one single pane of glass. Um, and then behind the scenes, we have Clear Process, which is our enterprise integration hub. And that connects all the systems like the SAPs and the Salesforces and the Oracle eBusiness of the world. Um, so within the call center, um, and as Brandon and Jeff can attest, there's this mythical concept of a customer 360 where you have all of the data and all of the functionality you would ever need to handle inbound customer inquiries. Uh, but, but the problem is very few contact centers ever get that single pane of glass. They, they typically have uh, processes where they say, you know, for if this happens, go to these three screens in SAP. If this happens, go to these four screens in Salesforce. And instead, we truly give them one place to come do their jobs. Um, and when within, within the contact center, that's really important because you're talking about call handling time and, you know, how can we get the customer's questions answered quickly um, so that that resolution time can go from maybe 10 minutes per call down to two minutes per call. So that's typically what we go after within the contact center space and just happens to be one of the big areas that we specialize in is how do we accelerate uh, agents so that they can get, you know, the customers happy um, and get them off the phone quickly because ultimately that's what we want to do. We want to get off the phone. We don't want to be talking to American Airlines for 35 minutes. You know, one of the things I'll note here, John uh, is uh, apparently a pretty modest guy because what he did not talk about when we introduced one another in this in the entry part of this webinar is that he's a process guy and he spent years elbows deep in the trenches in the process space. And that really was the inspiration for founding Clear Software. And so he is always, at least in my experience in working with 
with John. He's, you know, always 10 steps ahead of wherever I happen to be when I'm thinking about processes. But that's really, I think, the beauty and the magic of what he's done with Clear Software is really, really taking a deep dive into processes based on his years of experience, especially in, you know, with working with SAP and, and that sort of thing, and, and really worked hard to make this one pane of glass and to understand the challenges I think that people are working on in call centers. So there's my, you know, uh, my unsolicited testimonial for John Gilman at Clear Software. Yeah, I'm d definitely a process guy. It's all yeah. about, there's always ways to make things better, especially clunky business processes that Absolutely. involve swapping screens and, and doing crazy workarounds. Yeah, no, and I think that, you know, one of the things I tell my team all the time is that I'm not a process person. I'm the person that relies on smart people to go in and, and think every step of the way and put all these processes together. And then I come in and walk through it and poke holes every step of the way, you know, but I don't have, but my brain isn't wired in, in the way that yours is in terms of actually developing the process. So I have so much appreciation for that and for all of you, because I know that you all are process people and that's what you're passionate about. And those are the problems for customers that you're passionate about solving. And I think that's incredibly important. So, Brandon, over 90% of contact centers are still primarily on-prem. What's it going to take? How long is it going to take to migrate all of them? And, you know, what is your company? How does your company help in that regard? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, and for obvious reasons, you know, with COVID, this was a very different answer just <laughs> five or six months ago, right? I mean, we look at... Um, the contact center space has been has been for years, for decades, it's been predominantly premises based. And it was starting to move in the last three to five years. Some of some of the biggest push, even pre-COVID, ironically, came from the biggest premises based players. When you're talking prem equipment, you're talking Avaya, Cisco, uh, and, and Genesis, right? And they were the the biggest opponents to to cloud. Um, and and you know, in all fairness. They, they did some not so friendly media and marketing, you know, talking about the, the negativity of the cloud and all these things. What's, what's interesting about that is in the last three to five years, all of them have come out with a cloud product. So now they're, so now it's okay. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting approach. I think you, you add to that what's happening with, with COVID. We've gone from traditional industries like, um, you know, finance and, and, and healthcare and banking industries that we we thought would, would take a much longer time to move to the cloud. And then COVID hits, everyone has to go to the cloud if they're gonna stay in business, right? right? So the, the irony of all that is right now, according to the last uh, report, which which was in June, so it may be more, a little bit more, but a little bit less right now. But as of June, 92% of companies in the US that were in business were using remote employees and were using a cloud contact center product. Now, of course, some of them, or had a temporary setup, you know, so we don't really know what's going to happen. Right. But um, from if you, no matter who you look at, Gardner, Forrester, or whatever, if you put all that together, everyone's estimation is that 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 13% that was cloud before March, even when the dust settles, will be something like between 35 to 45%, depending on who you you believe. And the craziness of that is that it's been 10, to, it took 20 years to go from 10 to 13. And it looks like in, in about 10 months, we're gonna go from 13 to the, the mid 30s. So it's, it's, it's incredible the growth right now. The cloudification of everything, it's inevitable. Exactly. It only makes sense, right? It, it, it only makes sense. Mm -hmm. Jeff, Pega has introduced some products and features recently. Talk with us a little bit about how these products have been designed specifically to help contact centers, particularly now with the challenges that they're facing. Absolutely. Well, we talked really about how the volumes that we've seen just kind of went through the roof. And organizations, much like you were saying, were forced to race to the starting line when it came to their entire digital transformation of customer service, let alone the contact center. And what we saw is they started to look to other ways that they can serve the needs of those customers. And one of those ways was in applying intelligent virtual assistants. And with the goal of solving those inquiries before they even have to reach an agent. And it, if it's, it's, is it the cloudification or is it the COVIDification, right, <laughs> of, of that contact right. center strategy? And 
the ones that did this well were able to take advantage of cloud because now you, your intelligent virtual assistants, if, if done properly, can tap into the same type of case management technology that your agents would use anyway, understanding where that individual is in their journey and can scale up and down much better than, for example, your fixed headcount of agents could with demand. And the ones that were successful were ones that didn't apply, I'll call them dumb bots, right? We've all dealt with these uh, useless chat bots that many companies will have on their on their website that really don't help resolve anything, uh, perhaps waste your time. Intelligent virtual assistants that could understand your journey. So for example, if you opened a claim recently, and maybe that's why you're here to follow up on it, it understood that because you're authenticated on that website and it can actually help answer your questions, not just, you know, what are your store hours? And so they, they went to strategies like that and those did it have been incredibly successful. Uh, we're seeing 70%, 80% uh, of inquiries in many cases were able to be resolved right there in the intelligent virtual assistant without even needing to reach that agent, which uh, for, for those agents, what that does is it frees them up to actually have that empathy right. with their client, to actually spend the time to really understand and care for those things that really did require that intimacy. And so that's one of the great things that we're seeing right now. And it's, we, we don't see that stopping. Well, and I think that's tremendously exciting. That's exciting as both, you know, an analyst working in this space, it's, it's, it's probably even more exciting as a consumer <clears throat> because, you know, when you, we haven't talked a lot about adding the intelligence factor in, but there's absolutely nothing better when you're a consumer in having a problem, going to a website, having it quickly and easily recognize you, understand what it is you need, close the dots, and you walk away from those transactions going, oh my gosh, I wish every interaction was like that. And, and you know, the reality of it is, the reason I can remember this so vividly is because it happens so infrequently, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so that's that's what's really cool. And, and again, it's not just cloudifying things, it's adding intelligence into the process, which I know you all are also experts at, but that really is the game changer there and that not only leads to quickly being able to have customers resolve their own problems but as you said freeing up your service agents so that they can do other things or help customers who have more complex problems but gosh when you can check off some of those boxes to begin with or you can make it super easy for customers to take care of themselves i mean it's such a win for everybody and and I, I, my life goal is that this becomes less infrequent and just standard operating procedure won't that be awesome <laughs> and, and it's possible i mean it really is possible so, so John, talk with me a little bit about, you know, within, within the ERP and the CRM world, what do you see ahead? Will enterprises be migrating to a single solution or will they be using multiple solutions? Uh, it's a little bit of both um, because you can spend 10 or 20 years trying to consolidate your entire uh, enterprise onto one platform. And then lo and behold, you go and acquire three or four companies and guess what? They're running some other CRM and some other ERP system. So um, what technologies really need to be able to do if they're going to cloud enable business processes is be able to connect to multiple disparate ERP systems and CRM systems to give your enterprise a single source of truth uh, regardless of what you're running. So if you happen to be running nine instances of SAP and two instances of Oracle, it shouldn't matter to the actual business users who are carrying out different business processes, even within the contact center. So um, it's definitely going to be disparate. Um, I don't really see any single uh, technology provider taking over and, and dominating all of ERP or all of CRM. If anything, we're seeing them get more specific. There, there are niche solutions popping up all the time. So, you know, Workday is great at HCM, but, you know, they're not necessarily ever going to touch ERP. Salesforce has said they're never even going to think about touching ERP. So you're going to have a lot of solutions out there and they need to be brought together. Well, and that also is the challenge. And that's, I think that that's the beauty of vendor partnerships. We'll touch on that here a little bit in a minute. Um, you know, one of the things I love to throw out there, um, I, I'm most interested in use case stories. Brandon, do you have a customer use case story that you can share with us? And you know, it can be an anonymous one. You don't have to name the customer, but I'm just always interested in how people are using the technology that we provide, the solutions that we provide in ways that deliver results. So, you know, lay it on us yeah i i mean there's a lot of them right but i i, I think um to 
probably the one that's, that's more pertinent right now, and I hate to keep going back to COVID, but it's, it is the prevalent thing of what we're dealing with right now. Um, I, have, I have a very large uh, customer that I was consulting for who prior to March did not have um, work at home for their contact center, did not have work at home for their for their normal operational agents. They had something in place where their executives could spend a day, you know, at, at home a week, whatever, but nothing, nothing major. The uh, the pandemic hit. Everyone thought it was going to be short term, so they still did nothing. They they had essential employees in the office, not essential employees at home. Well, by April and May, we're figuring out, okay, now this is not going to be a quick fix. We need to do this. So they just rushed all this uh, equipment home. You know, they drop shipped everything. They they had they have close to three thousand agents, and they had all of them within two months all set up to take calls at at, at home and all this equipment in place. And then an interesting thing happened when I met with them in, in late July. Um, their conversation now is around the surprises. They, they, they had a slight dip in customer experience in the beginning, but now it's, it's back up to normal and it's increasing. Their morale has gone through the roof um, because all the employers are, are at home. All, all the normal things of adherence and scheduling are, are out the window because their employees are, you know, all they do is literally wake up. It's not that difficult, right? <laughs> So, um, so that in, in that instance, there, there, there are companies that never would have had, that didn't have work at home, never would have considered it had there not right. been uh, an, an impending instance like, like you know, uh, an impacting instance like this. And I think they're they're reaping the benefits of it. That same company um, announced to me in mid August that even when the dust settles and it's time to go back, fully forty percent of their existing staff is going to stay at home. And and for them, that means actually the liquidation of about nine buildings uh, worldwide, nine brick and mortars that they that they're no longer going to use. So the the impact is 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 the, the, and there's a lot of case studies like that out there. There's a lot of companies with with some experiences right now. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of that. It's really interesting. You know, the um, one of the one of the companies that I paid attention to early on was Nationwide Insurance. And and one of the things that they came out and said is that we are fully on work from home. We may have a very small sort of skeleton staff in some of our corporate offices, um, but we know that this works. And part of the reason, that, this is the most interesting thing about the Nationwide story. What they said is that we've been planning for this for a long time. We've been working on digital transformation for a long time. We didn't just start doing this because of a pandemic. And that allows us to say at this particular point in time, and this was like in April, you know, when everybody else was still shell-shocked, but saying, yeah, we've shifted we're good. We're not going back. It's great, you know, and, and look at the savings. But really part of that message was just really embracing digital transformation. And that's what we're talking about. You know, that's what this use case story is talking about, digital transformation that, you know, coincidentally allows your company to survive, <laughs> right? So Jeff, what about you? So I'm, I'm also thinking of an, of an insurance company. Uh, and, and funny how we're talking about insurers, uh, they should understand risk, right? Right. Um, and, and we're seeing the same thing. So in this case, I'm thinking of Aflac. And one of the things that, that they were able to do, uh, they, they, they planned ahead, they put in place, we'll call it the bedrock of case management technology there to orchestrate end-to-end -end processes toward outcomes, whether it's understanding where their claim status is or otherwise. And that was their supporting their agents, of course. One of the things that uh, certain architectures allow is to use that exact same case technology and activate it on other channels. So you're not duplicating logic in other channels. And in this case, they were able to take that, we think of it as taking it from the center out rather than channels in, mm -hmm. take that case technology and activate it right up to their website. And they were able to make that transition pretty much on a dime. And they were able to, in their case, they activated uh, uh, both live chat and a intelligent virtual assistant through that chat. And they activated 15 different types of interactions to be possible through cases in that intelligent virtual assistant. Incredible results. Uh, they're actually the one I was thinking of that's seen that 70 and sometimes 80% success in actually resolving that inquiry right there. And if you think about what's going on, it's not just better for the business, right? You're, you're obviously saving costs there uh, and being able to scale with the demand, you know, using the advantages of cloud. Uh, 
but you're resolving the issue. The, the customer's there on your website because that's where they want to get the resolution. They're not actually, right. like we talked about, looking to strike up a conversation and meet their new uh, BFF. <laughs> no, they, they just no. want to get their issue done and get on with their day. And in a particular case, when it comes to insurance, if you have filed a claim, you know, you, you're probably, you know, not in the best of spirits in, in any time. So you just want to get on with your day. And to have a solution that's being, being able to pivot and help you move very quickly with those changes in directions and flows, uh, obviously is, is paying a lot of dividends right now. You know, customer loyalty and customer trust are very elusive things. And it's those little things, you know, just when I talked about the joy that you have as a consumer, when things work in a way that like you expect, oh, I've got to call or I've got to reach out or whatever, and you just dread it. And then when that experience is good, you walk away, you tell other people about it because you're so surprised because it's so rare, you know, all of those <laughs> things. But, you know, brand loyalty and and uh, trusts are important things. And these are steps that help you know, sort of create that. And, and, and that's, I think that's a big deal. John, you have a use case story to wow us with? Uh, yeah, I, I guess not to break up the insurance party here, we'll just uh, stick w within the insurance industry. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's actually a customer that, that both PEGA and Clear share together, which is Blue Cross of Minnesota. And strangely enough, I'm talking to them right after this. So um, initially, we were brought in to streamline contact center activities across um, SAP and their AS400 systems. So uh, a lot of the claims adjudication and policy administration still happens within AS400, but all of their uh, financial activity, billing, invoicing, uh, payments, all of that happens uh, within SAP. So um, they definitely had users toggling between you know, 15 and 25 screens, depending upon the customer issue. Um, and we were, again, able to streamline that into a single web page um, that integrated multiple modules of SAP and uh, multiple AS400 systems so that they could quickly resolve uh, customer inquiries. So I think before Clear came into the picture, they were probably around uh, 12 minutes per call, and they got it down to two to three minutes per call, regardless of the complexity. So pretty huge for them from a call handling time perspective, but um, also the OPEX. I mean, the, the, the amount of annual savings they were able to recognize because a streamlined, simple experience just made their uh, customer service uh, reps just faster um, was just incredible. Yeah, that's... 12 minutes to two minutes, that's a big deal. We like that. So, you know, I think that if you've been hanging out with us and we thank you for doing that, you you can see that, you know, the cloudification of the call center is kind of a no brainer. And I think that the the use cases and the, the benefits to your company, the benefits to your customers, I think that those are pretty much a given as well. You know, and I, and I hope that what you've seen as a result of our conversation here is that migration doesn't have to be the challenge that you think it might be. And, and that I, I think, and we talk about this a lot here at Futurum, um, but I think that the secret sauce of success today I don't care what it is you're doing, but especially in this space and cloudifying anything, it's really what that magic mix of vendor partners that you're going to work with. And, you know, all three of you, you're here today because you work together across customers, across solutions, you know, and, and I think that the days of any one vendor being all things to all people, is really kind of a short-sighted thing. And, I, and I, I'm always suspicious when somebody, when a vendor tries to position themselves as being the all things to all people solution. And so I think that smart partnerships and understanding the nuances of those partnerships is really the path to success when it comes to cloudifying anything that you're doing. But, um, and, and I know that you guys are all nodding, so I know that we're on the same page here. And, and again, you all have partnered together, not on every single piece of business, but I know you guys partner together a lot. So with that, I am going to thank you, Jeff Nicholson, and you, Brandon Knight, and you, John Gilman, for hanging out here today. And I hope that you all have enjoyed this conversation. We'll provide you with some show notes that link to each one of these gentlemen's companies and give you a little bit more information about that. But I think with that, we're going to wrap up and say thanks for attending and we'll see you another time. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you.